disease, uh, so we don't recommend that. Uh, moya moya patients can have aneurysms also uh, uh, associated with the moya moya, probably because there's increased yeah. blood flow going through other vessels, the non-occluded ones. Here's a patient that we followed. We watched this aneurysm enlarge. We watched it rupture. Fortunately, we didn't know what to do about treating it while it was growing. Um, and fortunately, uh, the patient did well, and we were able to, to actually uh, uh, coil occlude the, the aneurysm. Um, this patient, 47-year-old um, man, who was the, actually uh, the groundskeeper at uh, Ridley Field, uh, has moya moya. Oh, Look wow. at his carotid arteries occluded, very poor blood flow. Um, but he also had aneurysms. And so the question is, you know, do you treat the aneurysms first, because they are at risk for rupturing? Do you treat the moya moya first? Um, and so we treated, uh, and you can see the, uh, the, the uh, high blood flow going through the back arteries, the, the basilar artery. That's why he has the aneurysms. So we treated the aneurysms first. We clipped the aneurysms, and then uh, we vascularized the, the moya moya. We've also seen moya moya associated with, with this disease. This was a woman driving across the Golden Gate Bridge who was pulled over by a police who said who thought she was drunk because she was wavering and in fact she had had a hemorrhage on the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh. Uh, and we thought the hemorrhage was from this AVM. This is an arterial venous malformation of that congenital blood vessel problem. But in fact, here's the AVM, but in fact she had hemorrhage not from the AVM but from the moya moya. She has two diseases and they can occur in association. Here we actually um, took out the AVM and then revascularized the brain. Here's our series, uh, uh, we published this. This was the first 450 procedures we did in 265 patients. We follow up from half a year to 17 years. And um, we compared this to the natural history. This is the best natural history study out of Wash U in St. Louis. And um, you can see uh, patients who had strokes or TIAs and had, had abnormal uh, uh, hemodynamic reserve, uh, abnormal blood flow. Those patients treated only with medicine had a 65% risk of having another stroke within five years. So very malignant disease. In St. Louis, when they treated with direct or indirect revascularization, they decreased that five-year risk to 17%. And our series of five-year risk of having a stroke uh, is about 5.5%. So it good a good operation for preventing strokes. Um, this is a uh, clinical scale, modified Rankin scale, uh, which uh, we looked at, and um, after surgery, 90% of the patients had um, very few symptoms. No symptoms or only slight disability with a mean follow-up of 4.1 years. Patients were presented with TIA, and we had 171 of them. Within one month, 85% of the patients no longer had TIAs, and 91% after a year uh, were free of TIAs. In the long term, we had two patients with new strokes, uh, uh, one was in a different distribution from our revascularization. One patient was had multiple strokes, uh, didn't make it. Two patients had recurrent bleeds in this particular uh, series. Well, one recovered completely. Uh, actually, they both recovered to baseline. We looked at our breath patency, and it's about 98% even over the long term. So here's our total surgical morbidity. Morbidity, this is within the first 30 days. And it's about a total of 3.6% um, uh, per procedure, or 5.7% per patient have some uh, major morbidity and mortality. Once you get out of the 30-day period, um, uh, really it's out of the first week, patients do extremely well, as most of you know. Here's something that's interesting, we don't completely understand it, and some of you may have experienced this, but uh, these are patients who wake up after surgery, they're fine, and then two to three days later, they develop problems. Usually it's on the dominant left hemisphere, uh, and there's problems with speech, or occasionally weakness. We don't see any strokes or swelling on the MR scan. We don't know what this is, but the symptoms almost always resolve within a few days to weeks. Um, the Japanese think this is too much blood flow, hyperperfusion. I personally think it's due to competing flows between the graft and the nasal collaterals while the brain's trying to, try to sort things out. And interestingly, we found that the blood flows we measure at surgery in the eight patients or nine patients who developed this had statistically higher blood flows than the patients who didn't develop it. So uh, now when we see higher blood flows at surgery, we tend to control the blood pressure to try to prevent this complication. 
this is a summary slide, not one patient. And uh, again, it's looking at blood flow uh, in the brain before and after surgery. And you can see the baseline flows uh, before surgery and after. We don't change that so much overall in, in all of our patients. But what we do change is the amount of increase in blood flow after the diamond sets the reserve. And it, it's markedly higher, the percentage increase uh, after, after surgery. So we increase the reserve that, 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 that all of you have. So in conclusion, um, we think that um, it, it's a good operation. Um, uh, and, uh, we use the blood flow studies to decide when to revascularize the asymptomatic hemisphere. We still don't know what to do about patients with just headaches or cognitive deficits, but not focal uh, TIAs or strokes. Is it a disease, a spectrum of, vas uh, of vascular diseases? Probably, we don't quite understand this. Is pediatric different from adult? We don't know. Um, the direct revascularization I prefer, um, it's well tolerated, it's feasible, provides immediate increased blood flow, and then we get it indirect as well. Um, whether it prevents future hemorrhage I think is a little more controversial. Uh, we had, uh, the Japanese have some suggested data that it does prevent future hemorrhage. We had in our larger series, six of 52 patients who presented with hemorrhage initially had late re-bleeds, 11%. Is that better than natural history? We think so, but we haven't proven that yet. Indirect also works, uh, and the Mike and Ed are going to talk about this. Very successful in children, um, and I use it for children who, who have small vessels. Uh, we had one four-year-old actually was able to do a direct graft because uh, he had large arteries. When there's lack of an adequate size donor recipient, we'll do indirect, or when there's a fell direct, and it also improves the natural history, blood flow, and the angiographic appearance. I want to end by talking a little bit about the, the research in the MOIM uh, and the genetics. Uh, these are uh, brother sister from different states that we treat with MOIM. -MOI. It's familial, 8 to 10 percent of patients, and we know that the incidence is higher in monozygotic twins and in siblings uh, and relatives compared with the general population. It's associated with these other diseases, which are genetic. The inheritance is autosomal dominant, uh, but it's a little more complicated. And until recently, there were linkage studies in siblings which showed these, these are chromosomal sites, they're not actual uh, distinct uh, genes. Um, and no gene had been isolated, but last year, uh, a susceptibility gene was published at this site in, in uh, human genetics. We have 12, I think we have now actually 14 families, but these were 12 families that we presented with uh, familial moi and moi. And this family uh, here is interesting because um, it turns out, uh, and we collaborated with Elizabeth Tournier and Lasser in Paris. She had two families with this uh, same kind of X-linked uh, Moya Moya, which also is associated with short stature and a dysmorphism of, of, of the face. Um, and uh, this just came out um, showing that this is a distinct gene mutation uh, that probably has something to do with angiogenesis. We've also worked with Diana Mueller with Houston. She's been looking at thoracic and aortic aneurysms. You know, uh, this is in the, in the chest. And it turns out that all smooth muscle, in the, which is part of arteries in the, in the brain and in the body, um, uh, have um, these components, actin and myosin. Uh, and actin and myosin interact, and that's what causes uh, contraction of muscles. And, and the, the, the muscle in the arteries is important so that the arteries can contract and dilate in appropriate, uh, as a response to appropriate stimuli. And what she did previously uh, was show that in her patients with aortic thoracic aneurysms, um, they not only had that disease, but they had problems with coronary arteries and strokes, including moya moya in some of the carriers. We sent DNA from blood from our first 182 patients and showed that one of them did have a mutation in the active gene and we isolated uh, seven patients had a new novel gene mutation in myosin, actually, 4% of the patients. So uh, we're learning much more about the genetics, which uh, means we may be able to not only diagnose, but even treat moya moya non-surgically in the future. And these patients with the mutation, when you look at their coronary arteries, you can see they have overgrowth of the smooth muscle. Again, it, it strengthens this smooth muscle hypothesis. And we worked with Steve Smith, at Stanford, and he developed that novel technique of looking at the arteries with a special microscopy in three dimensions called the ray tomography. And this is actually better than confocal microscopy, uh, which is the, the, the current technique that's used. 
and we showed recently um, that um, this is the control artery, and this it, this is uh, smooth muscle in green, and this is the where the blood vessel, the blood uh, flows here, and this is an elastic membrane. But look at the control artery. This is where the smooth muscle should be in the second layer, not in here. And in the moya moya vessel, this is the scapular brain artery. There's there's increase of migration of the smooth muscle through this elastic lamina into the inner lining. So we think that that's part of the problem. So I want to conclude by thanking our team at Stanford, um, and, and this really is a team effort in our Moya Moya Center. Many people in various disciplines are key to this, uh, including uh, our nurse coordinators, Teresa Bell Stevens, Jolie Babo, who many of you know. Um, our fellows uh, have contributed significantly uh, to, to this data. Uh, intraoperative monitoring, anesthesiologists, uh, stroke neurologists, and radiologists, and our research staff, uh, and Jill uh, McKinnis, who uh, many of you also know, she has been, uh, yeah, her daughter Tara has Moya Moya, and she uh, became so involved that she joins our, our department uh, as an administrative assistant, and she helps to coordinate much of this. And she, as some of you know who have been chatting with her, uh, she was diagnosed with breast cancer last this past year, and has been struggling with that, but doing very well. She's hospitalized now with a pneumonia, but I, I heard she's doing well, so um, she appreciates all of your, your thoughts. I know many of you have been, have been communicating with her. Um, but these are the people who also really uh, need credit. These are all the patients, um, and this is the reason that I stay in this area uh, and, and like to treat Moya Moya, because our patients get back to normal lives in terms of sports, in terms of music, in terms of uh, having families and children, winning uh, state debating contests. Um, we had our recent Moya Moya picnic at Stanford, had about 30 people from all over the country. Um, and um, as you know, it's, it's become a real uh, family of, of Moya Moya um, uh, friends, uh, relatives throughout, throughout the country, throughout the world. And I'm going to end by showing you um, a video, uh, get it back. And this is uh, Brad Jordan, um, who he and his mother gave me permission to show. This is a 17-year-old male um, with this uh, primordial dwarfism. And this is 10 months after uh, I clipped a ruptured aneurysm and then did bilateral indirect bypasses. And he's competing in, in a gymnastics tournament, not, not for primordial dwarfs. This is a statewide tournament in Illinois where he's competing with, with everyone else. And, um, oh. And this is called Power Gymnastics. Wow. Ten months. And he actually won the tournament, the state championships. So thanks again for inviting me, and uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here.